Hi and welcome to True Crime with Emma Kenny. If you haven't already subscribed, please do because you'll get lots of opportunities to see my new content when it comes out and every Sunday there's a premiere where I'll be covering either crimes or cults or something that interests you. Well, I hope that interests you, of course. Today I'm going to be talking about the Heaven's Gate cult. And it's something that you'll be hearing about at the moment because there's a HBO series on and it's in the press, but it's an area that's really interested me for a long time. And the reason that it interests me, and particularly at this moment in time, is that in our society in general, I can see certain things, how cults operate, that are playing out in modern day, even in your own life some of the things that are happening around behavioural insights and what's happened around COVID, these are things that actually are used behaviourally to train people in cults. Obviously, I'm not saying for a minute that we're all in a cult in the UK and the Western world. I'm just saying that when you think about behaviour modification, you might be able to relate to some of this quite easily because of current circumstances. So before we actually look at the Heaven's Gate cult specifically, which is, woo, a really, really unusual cult to explore. Not because of the outcome, because we've seen this in many other cult scenarios. We've seen this where people take their own lives, but more the gradual coming to of the way that they reached what I would consider an androgyny and the rules and restrictions that were placed around them under the guise of freedom of choice and also to kind of look at how that happens. How do people from ordinary, sometimes really well-to-do backgrounds find themselves seeking meaning to such a degree that they leave everything that they've ever loved behind forever? That's something that really strikes me. So previously, years gone by, there's always been a bias in my opinion Research has always kind of suggested that people who leave for cults have got really low self-esteem, they're really vulnerable, they might have very little family connection, they might be poor, so they're desperate. There are obvious catch points. So students at university, that's a classic catch point. When I was living at university, we had the Jesus Army come and it was a known catch point where people are looking and seeking meaning and these people come and love bomb you which we'll talk about later on. In fact some of the funniest memories that I have at the time that the Jesus Army were where I was at university is my friend was at a club being a DJ it was called Warehouse it was an awesome club to go to and the whole night he played things like Jesus and Mary Chain everything had a Jesus connection it was absolutely brilliant just in an ironic twist against what was going on But we lost people from my university to that particular organisation because people are seeking meaning. Now, recent research is also saying that those kind of stereotypes don't hold true. In fact, even though, of course, if you're more vulnerable, you want to belong, so you're going to hopefully find some connectedness and meaning somewhere, and sometimes that can be in cults, lots of people who nobody would think for one minute would leave their family, academics, intellectuals, people with good jobs, all the things that you kind of stereotype as well balanced. And yet these are just as likely to leave everything that they've known and move away with relative strangers. And if you think about it, it makes sense because cults don't want people with lots of problems. If you really want to run an organization, you need people on point. You need people who can converse and convince others to come with them. You need people who can be attractive enough to make those who want to go feel compelled. You need people who are charismatic because that's the kind of people that really connect. And you also need people who fully believe that what they are doing is for a higher purpose. So people ideally who are that seeking meaning, so they're going on that mental and physical journey towards enlightenment. These are not people that are gonna be awkward and problematic in lots of ways. So the idea that people who follow cults are reclusives with no social skills just doesn't play out. Although understandably, cults will accept people from all walks of life. But I think it's important because what we tend to do is we say that a cult is something that we'd be immune from and we're not. In fact, I think probably the people who are most at danger from joining a cult would be people who genuinely thought that they were immune 
As I was talking about earlier on, love bombing is another part of how you get people to connect with a call. So love bombing is to take somebody and make them feel like they are the most important person in the world. You know, to make them feel that they are everything that you would ever want them to be and to let them know that they'd be so cared for, so adored, so wanted, that they belong so deeply. And if you have any issues or if you're young and have hope, remember hope is amazing, but it can also be really dangerous in the wrong places, then when somebody or a group of people is making you feel amazing, that's going to reduce your stress, it's going to mean that you're obviously more vulnerable, and all of that flooding of affection and flattery and validation, that's a really powerful motivator in why people leave for courts. And when you look at the Jesus army that I was talking about before, they do something called flirty fishing. And flirty fishing would be sending out like beautiful girls to basically coerce people to go back with them. These girls would use their sexual attraction to really lure people in and it works really well. So they're basically being the best friend that you could ever have. And we see that throughout cults, you know, they'll make you believe that they are completely on your side, that they completely understand what you like, what you enjoy, that they concur with it. Everybody wants to find somebody who that they can just connect with. And that's exactly what these people do. They convince you that they know what's best for you but also they think that what you think is best for them. So you get this kind of complete connection and symbiosis where people are just agreeing with you and you're like, brilliant, this is my tribe. But actually this is all about getting you in. So once they get you there, that's when these kind of cult traits start happening. You know, you get taken away, they start talking about their ideology, they often isolate you from your friends and family. A big part of Heaven's Gate is you were not allowed to see your friends and family. You had to completely denounce them. At this point, one of the things that I need to mention is, unlike most cults, Heaven's Gate originally didn't have that really rule-bound leadership. So I've looked at lots of cults, but Heaven's Gate didn't have these kind of asserted leaders and that makes them stand out. In those early days, it almost seems like they were leaderless. So that is the one differentiation. People who went to follow them often struggle because they didn't really feel like there was leadership to follow and they were seeking that kind of authority, parent, all of those things that kind of make us feel safe. And Heaven's Gate stands out because it did not have that initially. Now, Everybody understands that part of the cult experience is about control. They're going to make you feel like you are everything to them, that there is nothing that they won't do for you, that you are absolutely part of this new family. And all the techniques that they use are going to be making you feel that you are loved more than you've ever been loved before. But usually there's another layer that starts to creep in, and that is fear. It's really important to get people in cults afraid because when you're afraid, you act in ways that you would not ordinarily act in. You act from a different part of the brain. Your emotions act in a different context. And the things that you thought you understood about yourself change often. Think about how it's been if you've been affected by the whole COVID experience and you're in a country watching this where you've been locked down, you've not been allowed to go out, you've been told to be afraid. All of these things that you thought you may have reacted to in one way, you may have found that you react completely differently. It might have changed the whole experience of the way that you live. So you can see how fear can really change the way that we feel about ourselves and our environment. Now, if I'm gonna add to that hell and damnation, hellfire, all these issues about not being able to transcend to the next level, as Heaven's Gate would call it, or heaven. Imagine being someone seeking meaning, believing that, as I do, that there is a bigger story. I call it the big beautiful beyond. I think consciousness continues. Everyone is welcome to have their own opinion. If you don't agree with me, that's absolutely fine. That's the difference between me and a cult. I'm not going to terrify you into believing that you absolutely should believe in what I'm saying. But for people like myself, I have this really flexible faith, I call it. 
So my flexible faith is that I genuinely think if I try to be a good person, then consciousness will continue and the lessons that I have learned, I'll take with me. And I'm sure that there'll be some kind of lessons that I'll need to learn again. But to some degree, as long as I'm trying my best, I think that I'm good enough, if that makes sense. So my flexible faith says that anybody and everyone is welcome, just don't be a dick. That's kind of the way that I approach my life and approach my faith and approach my spirituality. But when you're in a cult, it's very different. You have to really fit around these rigorous rules and exercises. And there's this big myth, which is, well, if these people are in a cult, why don't they simply leave? Just go. I mean, no one's keeping the door locked and so on and so forth. But that's like saying to a woman or a man who's in a coercive relationship, why didn't you just leave them when they were treating you so badly? Because if you are afraid of consequences, then you don't have choice. Choice is an illusion. Choice is something that you have when there is an equality where you can look at all the information and make an honest choice based on facts. But that's not how cults work because yeah, you can leave, but obviously you'll go to hell. Yeah, you'll leave, but you won't get this amazing promise that we're promising you right now. Yeah, you'll get to see your family, but don't expect to ever ascend. If you've got that desire to be spiritually grown, if you genuinely believe that you're following something into the arms of God and that's your conviction, then have you a choice? Can you run? Can you go somewhere safe? Is that safe space really safe at all? Because that's why cults are so addictive. Because the very haven that they attend initially becomes a prison. And the other thing about fear is it makes people disorientated. Certainly, I think we can all relate to that. Those moments where everything is so shocking and overwhelming that we're just looking for someone to solve the issue. And that causes dependency. Because if I've got somebody really strong sat in front of me telling me, well, you feel this way because of A, B, and C, but if you do A, B, and C, it will be okay, and keep promising me that it's going to be all right, even though they've exhausted me, terrified me, made me leave everything that I've ever wanted, that's a really powerful dynamic. As I said, it takes people years and years and years to leave coercively controlled and domestically abusive relationships, and it's not because they're enjoying them, it's because they're terrified. It's because they're confused. It's because fear has made them irrational around their belief systems and limits. So getting out is really, really tough and takes courage that very few people have because they've cut off all of their family connections. Some have been really negative towards their family members. Some don't have family members and so on and so forth. Some have given all their money to the cult so that they can't even imagine that they're gonna be able to begin again. And some have family members within the cult, which means that they can't leave without leaving them. It's a really problematic environment. Again, we're gonna come on to Heaven's Gate in a second. I just wanted to give you a background on why cults are so compelling and why really sensible human beings end up in them. Heaven's Gate was not one of those cults that bore in your family. In fact, they were as far away from that as they could possibly be. So there were no issues about dynamics of families becoming complex because you literally were not allowed to have your family members come with you. If you had children, you left them behind. If you had a partner, you could bring them, but you were not allowed to have sex, you were not allowed to be married, and you had to practice what I would consider an androgynous, non-sexual relationship. So it's very unusual when it comes down to cults in general to find a cult that kind of stands apart from the reasoning and the normal complexities and the normal order of cults that have existed pre and post Heaven's Gate. So how did the Heaven's Gate cult begin? Well, in 1931, Marshall Herf Applewhite was born near Corpus Christi in Texas. He's the son of a Presbyterian minister. I think that's important to note. So there's already a real religious undertone to his experience. And we'll understand why that was so profound for him because as he goes through school and moves into university and actually becomes a professor of music, 
He's employed as a choral director at the University of Alabama. And at that point, he is really excellent at what he does. People talk about him being incredibly charismatic, incredibly bright, fun, relaxed, a kind of guy that you'd want to hang out with. And he's actually consistently hired by universities and gets involved in the Grand Opera. He's an incredible, incredible singer. This is a man with real, real talent. And as he's moving through the ranks and receiving his professorship, you know, he gets a master's degree in music from University of Colorado. But then at Thomas's college, he's dismissed. He was really well liked there, but it turned out that he was having a relationship, a sexual relationship with a male student. So just think about that for a moment. We're in, you know, 1970, homosexuality has only just been made legal in the UK. And I'm sure around the world, there are similar incidences of it being illegal. We know it still is in lots of places. So we're still at an evolving point where being a gay man or a bisexual man or a pan man is not something necessarily that's accepted very positively. Also with his parent, there's an issue regarding what that says as a religious family. Is he acceptable? Or is he somebody that's ashamed and should be rejected? And I think we have to think about that because of what plays out in the future. But I think it's important that you remember that point because when we move on, there'll be some really bizarre activities that the Heaven's Gate cult carried out that will obviously, in my opinion, play back to those shameful feelings that he might have had of being a man who wasn't necessarily heterosexual. He had been married, you know, he had two children but he really did struggle with his attraction to men. It was a really tough time. And of course, the 70s are a burgeoning time of sexual liberation and freedom. And this is where we start seeing people feel more able to sexually experiment after their 60s. Now in 1972, a really pivotal day occurs. Applewhite meets Bonnie Lou Nettles, a nurse and an astrologer. She's really interested in UFOs. Her daughter talks a lot about the fact that they would go outside at night and hope to be picked up by a UFO. So clearly seeking meaning. Also remember she's a nurse. So she's vocational, she's caring, compassionate, and she's an astrologer. So she's got these kind of elements that say that she's quite new age, but she's also academic, well-trained, empathic. All of those are powerful motivators, aren't they, for attraction. Bonnie and Applewhite instantly connect. I mean, it's instant. So they meet in 1972. And by 1973, Nettles leaves her husband and her four children to go and be with Applewhite. Fully leaves them. She writes letters to her daughter. She lets her know what they're doing and they become less and less. But the point is, she doesn't question removing herself from her family. Again, really important because if you're going to be in a cult, you can't really have connections with people on the outside because there is an opportunity for them to drag you back in, right? And you don't want to do that. You know, your cult is dependent on people being the enablers of it continuing. So you can't trust that people will have connections with the outside world. That can be problematic on a media level, and it can certainly be problematic on a connection with the cult level. They go off and start a new age bookstore. This isn't unusual. There are lots of people with spiritual outlets in bookstores. We see them all the time, nothing completely unusual there. But they actually go on a soul searching mission. They really start exploring what is next for them. They even open a restaurant because they're trying to think about how to connect and how to be part of a community. And if you think about restaurants, that's where everyone goes to eat, yeah? It's where people connect. So again, at this point, pretty normal experiences, apart from the fact that she's abandoned her family, she's abandoned her kids, which I'm gonna always struggle with as a mother. I would die before anyone took my children away. I would find death more soothing than life. But obviously not every woman feels the same way. And we also have to remember that her new partner is somebody who's incredibly charismatic, compelling, and searching and seeking. However, make it clear at this point they're not involved in a sexual relationship, ever. So even though they are considered the leaders and together, in fact they're known as the two, 
they aren't actually involved in any kind of relationship. The restaurant fails, everything that they do for a period of time fails. They have problems with cars, they're camping on beaches, and this is when they become convinced that they are the two witnesses. That's the two witnesses that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. And this plays in as well to Applewhite's experience when he was teaching at a university and he had this psychotic episode of Break From Reality, and he came absolutely convinced that you no, know, he was here to change the world for the better. They got involved in petty crime, they used stolen credit cards, and even though a lot of the charges are dropped, Applewhite does spend six months in jail. Now, that should give us some insight. Hardly the behaviour of the apostles. Not what you expect, really, from your next Jesus, is it? Just gonna pop off, do a bit of credit card fraud, car theft, you know, just the normal kind of angelic behaviour. But nonetheless, during the six months in jail, he writes this statement. And again, he's used it with purpose, hasn't he? He's had his food, he's had his accommodation paid for, he's obviously educated enough to write whatever he wants, so he's used that time efficiently. Now, whilst he's in prison, he starts writing, I suppose, his first mission statement. And his first mission statement is all about the fact that it's possible to kill him and nettles and they'll just rise again and then ideally through that process any of the people who followed them they're going to be able to take away in a spaceship after they've been resurrected so we are now at a point where he's fully bought in to the idea that he and nettles are absolutely special in 1975 they take different names and they change the names a few times so guinea is nettles and pig is apple white. They do this throughout, like Bo and Peep, and we'll come on to that a little bit later. But this is when they start talking about next level UFO cult. This is when they start recruiting. And they start recruiting initially near Gold Beach, Oregon, and they get their new recruits. And that's when they change their name to Bo and Peep. So even though we have seen this strange, unconventional shifting and shaping, no rules, for example, strange names, different changes of name, and also another thing that they do is they send the students off to different areas to hold meetings, so they're not really in one place. And even though there is something bizarre when you actually watch now Bo and Peep doing their public appearances, court membership starts growing. A lot of these young people are seeking meaning. A lot of them are believing as we've grown into new age and people have started talking about UFOs and potentials of alien life, this belief that there is something bigger, even now that maybe the afterlife isn't that necessary. You know, maybe you can get on a UFO and go somewhere else, return to the mothership, who knows? Everybody wants to believe that there's something special about them, right? And everybody is special. But sometimes, because you don't know what that special is, you look for it externally as opposed to internally. Internal special is what we should aim for, you know, internal self-actualization. But if you're struggling to find it and other people offer you this possibility, then it's really easy, in my opinion, to see how going to a meeting and listening to a group of people who seem to be acknowledging that this has changed their life and offering a new opportunity and being surrounded by maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 other people who seem to be moved by this. So then there's a permission base to it. That's a big deal. That can convince anybody that it isn't strange to have these feelings. And if you feel lonely or if you feel lost, isn't feeling found really alluring? Personally, I can completely see why if you think you've been found, you're going to want to have that feeling continue. Now, in 1976, we see that in spite of new members coming, the cult's just falling apart. And the reason for that is they're camping in different places. There's not any leadership. One of the big foundations of Heaven's Gate in the 70s is that there is no responsibility for leadership. In fact, 
as opposed to it being community orientated, where you're thinking about each other and how to move forward as a community and following rules and regulations and looking to your charismatic leaders to tell you exactly what to think and feel and do, Bo and Peep are very different. They believe that the way that you ascend, the way that you reach the next level is almost around figuring out complete self experience. So withdrawing from, not relying on and growing within, which obviously isn't necessarily conducive to keeping a community together. At this point as well, there is a horrendous amount of negative press around Bo and Peep or the two. I mean, they are being laughed at everywhere. The American papers and media are just going for them. They're on news channels and people are referring to them in a whole heap of really quite disrespectful ways, albeit that they seem strange, it's still very challenging for them because neither of them want to be in the press. Yes, they want a community. Yes, they want people to follow them into their new belief system, but they do not want to be all over the press. And of course, it means that negatives are coming out about the history criminally, and that's not good for PR. So understandably, they're trying to lie low. Now, one of the things that changes when Bo and Pete come out from the shadows is that they start setting some really strict guidelines. They start banning drug use, which was rife in the 1970s. I mean, that's what the 70s were about, hallucinogenics, mind expansion, and they also ban sex. Again, this is a time of liberation. We already know that there were issues in Applewhite's experience because he was struggling with his own sexuality. So this is probably more about him and less about his followers. He has an issue with sex. He has an issue with his self-shame, even though it's not needed. Yes, he finds men attractive and has sex with them, but he's obviously decided that this is not acceptable. And his way of managing that, his self-stress, is to exert that authority over the group. And they take the group away. They go into seclusion until 1992. It's a long period of time that they're completely outside of the media, of any other communities. I mean, they're known in the areas that they are, but they're not public facing to some degree. You know, they're not out there doing those meetings and so on and so forth. And during this period, he actually takes on the name Doe and nettles the name T. Anybody thinking about a musical? Yeah, Doe a deer and all that. That's why, because uh, Nettle's favourite musical was, in fact, The Sound of Music. They used to watch that as a group together constantly. And for whatever reason, this is why they kept on taking these strange names. By October of that year, they had less than 70 members. So, you know, this really is a declining cult. Now, just going back a little bit, there's a real spanner in the works. In 1985, Nettle's actually dies of cancer. Remember, one of the Heaven's Gate belief systems is that the bodies, the full live bodies, will ascend to heaven, essentially, on a UFO, but they'll become divine beings, aliens, whatever you want to call it. But Bonnie gets cancer, and it's really serious, so she loses an eye, it's horrible. By the way, she dies alone in hospital, her family were not even aware that she was sick. Not the nicest end for somebody who thought that they were following a divine experience. And because of this, that causes chaos, understandably. I mean, if your main leader dies of a human condition and the body is still there, then what does that mean about the other rules, regulations, belief systems, and so on and so forth? That must have been really catastrophic for some cult members. Remember, they've left their families and friends. They've had no contact with people. They've maybe been away from people for years and years, and suddenly they're questioning every single thing that they ever believed. Fortunately, after Bonnie's death and this absolute breaking down of a cult, they watched the well-known documentary Cocoon. As in, if you haven't seen it, look up the film Cocoon. It's a film. <laughs> So it's, it's not a documentary, just in case you think I'm literally talking about a documentary, but you'll get what I say when you look at it up. And um, they genuinely believe that they're gonna get picked up by aliens. So again, we've got this UFO experience coming through and they genuinely think that they're gonna get picked up. 
Around 1992, we see the group coming out again into the public eye for about three and a half months. They do a video called Beyond Human and they put it on satellite TV. It doesn't actually bring back any new followers, but it does bring back some of the group who'd left. Re-emerging from a cult is challenging. It really is because you've got used to an environment. You've been coerced, you've been trained, you've been controlled. Even if you don't think you have been controlled, you have been controlled. That's the issue. Very often you think that you're a free spirit, you think that you're free, but you're not. So when you go back into society, it can feel really scary. There's too many decisions to make. There's too, too many people to talk to. There's too many freedoms that suddenly feel anything but free, so people return. In fact, one man goes with his wife because he's struggling with their marriage. So he sees these kind of adverts about Heaven's Gate and he ends up going with her to hopefully resolve their issues. They leave their four children behind. And then after a few weeks, he realizes this is a terrible idea and she stays. And she stays right until the end. So it shows you that even people who you think you know and love are actually very able to be manipulated to remain or attend a cult, even if you thought you knew them better than anyone else. That's the key. No one really knows why people end up in cults. We just know that people who are entirely sensible do. In 1993, Apple White plays his trump card to some degree. They're making quite a lot of money with respect to them because the internet has provided opportunities for them to start creating websites. In fact, you can still look up the Heaven's Gate website today and there are two surviving members who actually run it. So these people were able to maintain their lifestyle. They lived in a beautiful place and they had access to good food. And there were also opportunities where people had left trust funds to them. So they weren't struggling financially. He places, because of this, a one-page ad in the USA Today titled UFO Cult Resurfaces with Final Offer. Really powerful language, isn't it? We're back. We've got one less offer for you. I mean, you're going to be interested, aren't you? I'd be interested in that. I'm not saying I'd go, but I'm saying I'd be interested in what was the offer. What is it that these people know that I don't know? Because remember, you're looking at people and you're thinking to yourself, how are they different from me? What if these guys know something? What if they really do have the key to something, the key to another plane? What if I'm missing out? And add to that that you might not be feeling in a great place or your relationship might have just broken down. Understandably, there's an allure, isn't there? Most of us feel that, don't we? that vicarious experience, that excitement, this imagination that there's something greater, bigger, more incredible than what we're living now. I do. I think pretty much everyone I know does, particularly at the moment, we're all imagining that something incredible exists out there. And if we could have a piece of that now, wouldn't you? In 1995, the group goes into seclusion again and they start really working on that opportunity of making money using the internet. They get their messages out to the public and they actually start their initial business which is called Computer Nomads. In September, they post their first exit statement and that's all about addressing the religious world which is primarily, in their opinion, Christians. In October, they post a second exit statement on the internet. Now that's all about clarifying the first exit statement. They then rent a $1.6 million mansion in Rancho Santa Fe. I mean, it is on point, guys. It's Hollywood. Honestly, it's what you see in the movies, that kind of house. It's incredible and so clean. You can tell that there's absolute order just by looking around the actual mansion that they all die in. So that website business, which they then rename Higher Source, starts being relatively popular. I mean, they're bringing in a really good amount of money, which again shows you that there is order, there is connection, there is community, there is resource, they are working together. So even though they're going on this really individual journey, they are still connected and respectable, shall we say. They really are clearly learning how to protect and maintain themselves and those that they share their lives with. January 1997, 
they again post those exit statements one and two on the internet and they start talking about going on this trip and they also start closing down the business a little bit. They send letters out to their clients about the hale Bop Comet, telling them that this hale Bop Comet is their sign. And the reason for that was because they believed that there was like this shadow behind it and that that shadow was the UFO. So the comet is definitely coming, it comes round, you know, every few thousand years. And this is massive for them because they've predicted or Applewhite has predicted that there is this shadow there and that is the UFO and that's their sign to leave Earth. Now, before you say this is really crazy, which I understand you're going to think, there is a guy who knew Applewhite and they had a conversation. He was involved in kind of paranormal and religion and all these things. And he said, how do I make contact with you? And Applewhite said to him, you just need to send a message to me. Just think about it. And one day he thought, I wonder what's happened to these guys. So he thought about him and sent him a message. And the next day, Applewhite called him and said, I got your message. Not saying anything, but strange, right? By the way, I'm not suggesting that there's a UFO comet attached to Hellbop, but I don't think that we should ever underestimate the human condition and the power of the human condition. And the fact that that happened kind of made my hackles stand up because maybe Applewhite did have certain knowledge and maybe Applewhite did have certain capacities and abilities that were why he found life on this planet so challenging because maybe he wasn't given a space to develop them or maybe it became something more psychotic because he wasn't able to channel them appropriately. He wasn't believed enough. On March 23rd, Hellbop's closest approach to Earth occurred and that involved at this point 15 of the group killing themselves. They took phenobarbital with applesauce and a shot of vodka. And we know that some of them also placed plastic bags over their heads to assist the process because obviously it meant they suffocated. March 24th, another 15 do the same, exactly the same means. And then on the 25th, another nine do this with the last two disposing of the other's plastic bags. On March 26th, bodies are discovered by a cult member who wasn't present during those deaths. The deaths were planned acutely the method was followed precisely and the interviews and the interviews on heaven's gate those who took their own lives literally all have an interview you can still go and watch it on youtube i'll put the link below you can literally listen to them talking about how they feel about leaving this planet how they're ready to leave their bodily vehicles, how they're excited, how they don't want people out there to believe that they were controlled, how they don't want people out there to imagine for one minute that they weren't happy that they were going to be leaving these human vehicles. They can't wait. Also important to acknowledge at this point that several of the men who were found had been castrated. They had flown to Thailand and they'd been castrated. Some of these were young guys. They did that because they saw sex as an inhibitor or if they were on hormones to prevent themselves feeling sexual, they weren't effective enough. So they actually physically castrated themselves. Now, I think about that as a real level of self-harm, but also a buying in to this almost shared ideology that Applewhite brought, which was that to truly make it to the next level, they had to fully denounce everything and anything that made them human. And if you watch the videos that I'll link down here of the interviews, you'll also note some really clear similarities. Hairstyles are pretty much the same. The clothes look the same in the people that are wearing them. They come in twos, but they're not sexual. They're just connected. They are with each other, but not actually in relationships. And everything's very much about an individual journey to achieve this higher state, to get to the next level. They do not seem coerced. They do seem like they think out everything that they say, but you've got to remember the reason that they do that is because they are thinking about every single thought that they're having, having an impact on whether they get to the next level or otherwise. The rules of Heaven's Gate were really complex. They actually had binders 
of how to shave and how to do certain things. Even when it came down to making things like pancakes, you couldn't just say, oh, I'm gonna make the pancakes. You know, you had to get the right mixture, the size, you had to know how long to cook it on one side. You had to have it on a particular burner level. You had to know how many certain people got. You had to know how much syrup to put on it. Imagine that. Imagine having to go through that kind of ritual constantly. I mean, you're constantly focused, aren't you? Now, this is really important because if you want to convince people to take their lives, then it's incremental, right? You can't just say, hey, let's just go and take our lives and go to the next level. That's not going to work. There's going to be too many challenges and obstacles because the human condition, even our brain hormones, like our GABA hormone, is there to prevent us doing those kind of things. I mean, we've all had those moments, right? We've all had those moments where you stood on something tall and you think, oh, what would it be like if I just threw myself off? Now, you're not suicidal in that moment. There's just that playing with the idea of what that would mean, letting go, right? But the GABA hormone is like, nope, we're definitely not doing that. It's a terrible idea. And that's why you can't get people who are at the point rational and relatively well adjusted to do something extreme. If I'm gonna make you do that, it has to be incremental. I have to replace your entire social structure, your entire belief structure, your entire economic structure. I have to indoctrinate you. And indoctrination is what cults do. If you think about modern day terrorism, it's the same. It's this idea of taking something that comes from a good place and then bastardizing it and creating a caricature. But because the person has been on the journey since the beginning, they don't necessarily recognize the nuance of change and shift from something that should be there to do good to something that can be really, really devastating for themselves or others. And this idea of breaking out of Western mentality is a big part of it. In fact, a lot of cult deprogrammers say that one of the problems that people face in cults is that you've essentially rejected everything you ever thought. You've rejected all your thinking. You've rejected the beliefs that you held from a child. And you've almost bought into this belief system that's now so powerful that you can't even see the truth when it's staring you in the face. The fact that there's this androgyny as well in Next Level, in Heaven's Gate, means that there's this desire to eradicate the individual, to create clones, and I can't encourage you enough to watch some of those interviews. You'll see what I mean. These are not stupid people. These are not foolish people. These are not pitiful people. Because I think when you start talking about people like that, you miss the bit that's important, which is, what was so lacking here? What was so broken about our Western civilization in particular that people were seeking not just meaning, but complete escape? And not just complete escape, but on that journey to completely close down individualism and even to distort their form, to try to remove themselves fully from what you and I would consider normal experience. I think that's really important because if we're gonna act like these people were pitiful losers who just couldn't get their shit together, we're literally gonna leave the door wide open for people that we love to one day disappear. Because it's those stereotypes, it's those myths, it's those lies, it's those misplaced beliefs that mean that people end up in cults. Because when they meet members and they're intellectual, academic, fun, charismatic, kind, everything you've told them will fall apart, right? Because that's not the stereotype they've heard. It's more important to educate people about how alluring these kind of situations can be. Heaven's Gate didn't just have rules, it had instituted strict policies, no sex, no human level relationships, no socialising rule. They couldn't go out and socialise with other people and everything was very much internal. And that's incredibly, incredibly distinct to the way that we live in our communities. In fact, I think the last 12 months in the UK, we've had to do a lot more individualistic experience and I've hated it. I'm human. I'm 98.8% related to chimpanzee cousins. 
those primate cousins are what we should be doing. We should be playing, cuddling, having sex, enjoying ourselves, and just being together. That's what a great society is about. Whereas when it looked at Applewhite and the society around that, it was kind of the absolute juxtaposition of what makes healthy humans. And yet they were healthy and they were happy when you see them. They seem stranger to you and I, but nonetheless, they're not fools. They were always laughing and giggling. In fact, I'd say they were like children. They were very capable, but there's this naivety about them. It's almost like they've abandoned the adult-centric state and just allowed themselves to return to a place that potentially many of us have forgotten, but also that makes them incredibly manipulated. So if we go back to a more childlike state, we're essentially more able to manipulate, right? And it does feel a little bit like that, that they're all like a group of people, kids living in this big house, eating the same kind of food, shaving the faces in the same way, not having sex, not going outside of the community, but all following these really rigorous parental experiences and exercises, waiting to go home to mum and dad. That's kind of the way that it feels. I mean, comment and let me know, but that's how I feel. The night before the suicides began, a waiter who served them at the restaurant they went to eat at regularly said that they were really relaxed. They all had exactly the same meal. They had iced teas to drink, they had salads with tomato vinegar dressing, turkey pot pie for the entree, cheesecake with blueberries on top for dessert. And they were really nice people, really polite. No one were depressed, everybody was chatting. I guess they were excited. Now that gives you some insight, doesn't it? These aren't people full of fear. These are individuals who are eating a last meal, enjoying it together, socializing. They're not seeing that they're not gonna see each other again. I mean, who knows? I'm not saying that they didn't, I'm certainly not. I can't say that. I would never patronize. It's not on me to make a subjective or objective call regarding what I believe happened. What I'm saying is when you look in, through that microscope of their experience, they were acting like they were happy. They were going on a holiday. A little bit like when you go to the airport and you get yourselves excited. Remember what it's like to go to the airport? Oh God, how I crave that. But you know, you go there and you're like, oh, I don't care about paying this extortionate price for this salad that I'm buying because I'm getting on a plane and going somewhere hot. It's kind of the way that you feel, isn't it? You just wanna get on with the journey and you're kind of going through that honeymoon experience. And I think that's what they were genuinely going through. This is not about doom and gloom. This is not depressing. This is not suicide. This was freedom. That's how powerfully manipulated they'd become. That because they'd let go of all their own beliefs and systems and bought into these new ones, that those incremental shifts that led to them becoming so susceptible, manipulated, and eventually dead, had been so small, such tiny nudges, that word's very current for me at the moment, those psychological nudges that get you to do what they want you to do. It's powerful, isn't it? Imagine that for a year, maybe more, maybe 10, 15, those nudges making you think that completely intolerable things are tolerable making you believe that everything that you know is right is now wrong, making you fear for yourself, making you worry that unless you follow rules and regulations, someone's gonna come for you. You're not gonna get to go to that place that you always believed you deserved. Imagine that on loop, having to walk in certain directions or attend things in a certain way really powerful nudges. Cults use those. That's what cults do. When Heaven's Gate members were actually discovered, something, again, that just makes them not individuals. They're a group of androgynous beings. When they were discovered, they were all wearing identical black and white night decade sneakers. And this company, unsurprisingly, decided that it probably wasn't a look that they were gonna go for. They were like, it's probably not our best winter season shoe, you know, let's discontinue that style. Because everybody associated 
the Heaven's Gate Cool Deaths with that particular brand. They're now a collector's item and a pair that was found in a storage unit in Arizona went up for $6,660. And the person who was selling them actually put Apple White Space as part of its advertising. Never one are people to miss out on an opportunity, are they? Like, ooh, would have cost me $18? Gonna make 6,600 and whatever. You know, one of the things that I think we've got to accept, you know, before I conclude this particular cult deep dive is these people weren't stupid. You know, you can think what you want. You think, think they're crazy. You can watch their videos and imagine, well, I would never be like that. But this is all about wanting to be better, bigger, more grown, more developed, more free. It's about a spiritual desire. It's about searching for something more important than just you. It's about believing that you are part of a bigger picture and they are really powerful, powerful markers in human experience. You know, you think about cults that involve sex, very powerful, or those that are enlightening. There are ways that they help you believe that through their connection, you will achieve your goals. That's why so many cults operate courses and opportunities to go and learn. It's not to educate you, it's to infiltrate you, it's to indoctrinate you. But if it has a shiny cover and it looks like it must be the real deal, then we trust. Human beings always at first trust unless they've had a really terrible life and they've been brought into the situation of consistently defending themselves against everything and that's equally as damaging. Most of us, if something looks good, sounds good, seems good, we kind of accept it is until we find out and often when it's too late. Apple White's and Nettle's relationship was a friendship. It was spiritual, it wasn't sexual and they genuinely thought it was about fulfilling a biblical prophecy. Whilst it might be difficult for you, you might never have thought about UFOs or life outside this universe. My mind just expands when I say that stuff. Cause I'm like, of course there'll be a life outside this universe. I don't know what it will be like. It could be like an amoeba on a rock somewhere, or it could be far more intelligent life. This might all be some Sims game, like Elon Musk thinks, you know, those kind of thoughts and feelings don't kind of go over my head. I'm like, yeah, there's room and space for everything. But UFOs have always been those things that interest a lot of people. There's a massive movement, alien life and the search for it has been a story as old as time. And you can go back to cave paintings and see evidence of strange beings, the same in Egyptian times and so on and so forth. So our seeking, our desire to know more, be more, go somewhere else, you know, experience galaxies beyond, that's nothing new. The thing that interests me about Heaven's Gate cult is that they became really, really transfixed on this belief that they were aliens in human form and the only way that they could return essentially to their mothership and to the heavens and so on and so forth was to leave their vehicle. So this body that they had spent such a long time making into androgynous beings that had no feelings, so to speak, no aggression, no sexual desire and so on and so forth. It had been a plan to return to that alien state. And everywhere you look from the media to books to comics from day dot, it's everywhere this kind of indoctrination. Just because you don't fall for it being a reality doesn't mean that one, it isn't a reality, there could be alien life. And secondly, it shouldn't undermine another person's belief about it. Unless we have these kind of conversations openly and people are allowed to explore and express themselves without shame or fear, you're gonna alienate people. And I think that Heaven's Gate Cult is the absolute metamorphosis of alienation, where people hold beliefs that are really true to them that society humiliate and reject. And the consequence of that was the isolation and further indoctrination of a group of human beings who to all intents and purposes should have been paying taxes, living with their families and getting on with their life. And that's a really powerful indicator of why we must have open discussion about differences of opinion. After spending a lot of time really deep diving into Heaven's Gate, it leaves me with mixed feelings because these people were genuinely coerced into a belief system and they took their lives and they left family members 
And that's devastating for everybody involved. But the thing that I look at compared to, for example, Jonestown call is that they didn't go without wishing to of their own volition. Yes, I know we can argue that they didn't have choices to make because they were so born into that belief system. But what I'm saying is, at the moment where they took their own lives, it was not a forced scenario. You know, we see in cult massacres that often there are leaders who are carrying out these appalling acts and there are people resisting and they're still forced into a position of submission and death. But that wasn't the case here. It was planned and executed perfectly. They left their suicide notes to some degree on video. They'd expressed why they were going and what they believed and they did it in a way that for them I think was relatively painless but that to some degree in some weird way brought them great joy. They felt a complete disconnection with Western society in particular but with humanity and that is probably the saddest part about this because cults shouldn't exist and the reason that they shouldn't exist is that there is everything that we require in our world around us in other people and communities than we could ever need how have we got so lost and we have become so lost so disconnected so fundamentally a juxtaposition to what humanity requires that people have and will continue to seek these kind of connections. Our communities have ample resources for people to feel happy, healthy, connected, spiritually open, and with an opportunity to grow and develop without fear and without need to reject and without a need to abandon. And I think that until we recognise that we are going wrong in the way that our communities and our society is continuing, we're going to see people abandoning and rejecting the very thing that they were born into. There is definitely a problem in mental health in the Western world and it's declining further. And so what does that say about how we're meeting our individual and community needs and how do we change that? And for those of you listening who feel that you're connecting with this now on quite a individual level, personal level, because of some of the things that I've said, particularly when we think about loaded language, that's a big part of cult indoctrination. My loaded language would be, for example, not referring to my body as a body anymore. I might call it a vehicle or I might look at my private parts and give it another name. So I completely step away from what makes me who I really am. And loaded language is used in calls. The same as the illusion of choice. Well, you have a choice, but this will happen if you make that choice. And on a personal level, a lot of you might be thinking, I have felt like that in my life, you know? I felt like people have said, well, of course you can do that, but the consequences will be really bad. And even though I've no evidence for it, Ooh, do I want to take a risk? See, that's the thing, isn't it? All it really takes for somebody to have power over you is for you to believe that you aren't powerful enough to resist that choice. And when it comes down to it, how many times in our lives have we all done that? Certainly for me, I can relate to that hugely at the moment. What I feel and what I think versus what I do and how I act, they're not in synchronicity. And probably now more than ever, I fully understand how human beings who are well-adjusted, well-balanced, from great backgrounds, with intellectual capacity, can find themselves just like Heaven's Gate. I'd be really interested to know how you feel and how you think about this. There is an amazing HBO series on at the moment. If you can get it, please do. It's on Heaven's Gate. It is a deep dive beyond belief. I do not do it justice by any way, stretch or form in this, but I hope you've enjoyed it. And please, please, please let me know how you feel and make sure that you join in next week for a, another one of these lives. Also, just to say, I have an app out called Appy Wellbeing. If you go on the App Store or the Play Store, you can get it for free. 
there's no hidden costs, it's just a free wellness app and hopefully at this moment in time where everything's a bit crazy, we'll be able to at least offer a little bit of support and join me again. Take care.